Father, please open our hearts to your word. We need your word so much today. And although the beginning of our worship has been disturbed by technology, we want now to really focus on your word. Let it speak to our hearts. Let it not be just my words, but your words speaking to us. Come and deal with us. Convict us as we need to be convicted. For Jesus' sake, amen. Now, lots of Christians go on holiday to Greece to go to visit the, and go into Turkey and visit the seven churches of Asia. Anybody here been to the island of Patmos? No? Okay. I have met Christians who've been to Patmos, that's why I ask. And they say, oh, it's a wonderful, peaceful place. It wasn't when John was there. When John was there, the island of Patmos was a prison colony. So imagine Nelson Mandela on Robben Island. Um, off the coast of Cape Town, sitting in a quarry, breaking rocks. That was what John was doing. That's what it was like for him. Um, John doesn't tell us in this book, but we're pretty certain that he was the same Apostle John who wrote John's Gospel and the letters of John. But this book, the book that he wrote while he was in captivity on that island, the book of Revelation, is the most dramatic book that's ever been written. It's the most mysterious book that's ever been written. It's the most spectacular book that's ever been written. Even non-Christians find the book of Revelation fascinating. Um, And so we're going to look at two passages today. This morning we're going to look at the opening eight verses of chapter one. And then this evening we're going to look at chapters 10 and 11 and sort of do a big overview of the, the central event of the book of Revelation. Now, I want you to appreciate that John's captivity is very important to this book. There was every reason for John to be thoroughly discouraged. If you had been in his situation, what would be going through your mind? The other apostles have been executed, martyred for their faith, one by one. One after another after another, they are dead. And John is left probably as the last one of the apostles of Jesus... They have paid for their witness to the risen Jesus with their own deaths, and he's now paying with slavery. And it would be so easy for him to say, well, the first generation Christian church has been defeated. It's being destroyed. It's nearly over. It's gone. Give up. What's the point of continuing? Why suffer if all that happens is that the world rejects us and then we die? Maybe you can identify with John's sense of isolation and the rejection of the world and the hardness of um, the kind of territory we're trying to sow the gospel into, the stony ground of of our generation. Very often it's a wave of indifference, isn't it? We've been out doing uh, street evangelism on the streets of Didcot near Abingdon and, and lots of people see that we're handing out leaflets and say, oh, that's religious, I don't do religion, and pass by as though we were selling double glazing to people who already had it, sort of thing. Can the gospel still have an impact? Is Christian mission still worthwhile in our world? And I would say, because of the other conversations I've had out there on the streets, that yes, it is. There is still a huge need for the gospel. There is still a huge spiritual hunger. And I reckon, in all the present crisis that we're going through as a country at the moment, this is a spiritual moment to be proclaiming the gospel. This is a time to point people to God. This is a time to have confidence in the gospel. For we are the people who've got the certainty and the hope. And we mustn't keep quiet about that this Christmas time. While John is in this pit of discouragement, on the Lord's Day, he was in the spirit. Uh, We're not entirely sure what that means, but we assume that as a prisoner he didn't have any other Christians to gather with perhaps and and, and yet he is worshipping God on the Lord's day and he hears a voice like a trumpet compelling him to write down what he saw when he turns to see this voice who it is that's speaking he sees the risen Lord Jesus himself a son of man he's described as uh, in verse 13 A son of man dressed in glorious robes with eyes of blazing fire. A voice so powerful that it sounded like rushing waters. You couldn't resist the sound of it. His face shining like the sun. And John fell down before him, thinking his end was come. 
And the Lord declared to him, verse 17, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead. And now look. It's a wonderful phrase, that, isn't it? And now look. I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. John, in all your sufferings, you must look up and see the unseen. You must see the Lord Jesus risen in all his resurrection power, and he's extending his kingdom across the world, and no power of evil will be able to overcome it. It's a wonderful truth to get hold of this morning, isn't it? And so, John, write down these glorious visions that the Lord Jesus is giving you. And that's how the book of Revelation came to be. And we're just going to look at the prologue this morning, because prologues are very important. You get a huge clue from the prologue about what the whole of the book is about. And you can sum up the prologue very simply in five words. See reality as God sees it. See reality as God sees it. Look at the world that completely discourages you, but look at it through God's eyes and take courage. And I, you know, honestly, I've, I've never felt a Sunday morning that more needed this than today. You know, I've never felt so disorientated by the events in our country as we have felt this week. I'm wondering where it's all going to end. And I've been listening to political commentators saying, what does this compare with? And they say, I don't know. It really is a bit of a political earthquake, isn't it? Or the potential for an earthquake. And, and it shakes us to make us wonder what we care about and who we are and all those fundamental identity issues. Well then, in that situation, come and see reality as God sees it. This passage breaks down into four parts. We're going to think about the Word of God. We're going to think about God himself, the Lord who's revealed. We're going to think about the church, and we're going to think about the world. Here's the first encouragement. What's the first part of reality to get in place? It is that God speaks, and we can trust his Word. We have not been left to guess about God or the meaning of life because God is a God who reveals himself. This is the book of Revelation. Um, some people call it the apocalypse. Yeah? Why would we be studying the apocalypse at a time like this? Yeah? There is a bookshop in Foy in Cornwall that put a label in their window recently which said, we have moved all our post-apocalyptic fiction into the section marked current affairs. <laughs> I thought it was a very good joke. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's what it feels like, doesn't it? Everything we took for normal is kind of being shaken and, you know, what's going on? And here is a book of apocalypse, but that's because we've kind of squiffed the word apocalypse to another meaning. What is the word apocalypse, the Greek word apocalypse, that's what it is, the Greek word, what does it mean? Well, you have a wedding here, okay? And everybody's waiting for the bride and she's 10 minutes late and she comes up the aisle and she comes here up onto the platform and here's the bridegroom and the bridegroom goes up to her. During the first hymn, he lifts the veil so he can see his bride's face and behold, it is an apocalypse. <laughs> For that is what you are doing. It's an unveiling. It is a revealing. That's what the word apocalypse means. And our God is not a God who dwells and enjoys dwelling in mystery and ignorance. He's a God who loves to reveal himself. That's why the Bible ends with a book of Revelation. Look at verse 1, the revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testifies to everything he saw, that is the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. John is given a series of apocalypses, a series of revelations, which he now writes down as a book. What kind of revelation is it? It's a revelation from Jesus Christ. It could just as equally be translated of Jesus Christ. John has received this revelation from Jesus, and it's all about Jesus. 
Much of what John sees and has explained to him is explained through an angel, an intermediary, and John testifies to everything he saw. But notice these two phrases at the end of verse 2 that John says, this is the content of what was revealed to me, the Word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. The Word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. You see, the, the book of Revelation completes our Bibles as a grand finale of everything that God has revealed about himself. The Bible is the Word of God. Jesus himself said of the Old Testament, the Scriptures cannot be broken. That's the authority that Jesus regarded Scripture with. And, and the whole Bible is one complete Scripture. He said to the Pharisees who, who loved reading the Bible for themselves and studying the minute de detail, he said, you search the Scriptures, don't you? What you don't realize is that these are the Scriptures that testify about me. I'm the fulfillment of everything that's written there. So God revealed himself to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and promised that through their seed, one person, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. Their lives were recorded by Moses in the book of Genesis, the first book of the Bible. And Moses led Israel through the Exodus, the great saving event that shows how God redeems people from spiritual slavery by a great price and sets them free to let, lead them to a promised land, a new life with God. And so much of the way God saves is revealed in that wonderful Exodus event, and it, it, it keeps on um, repeating itself all the way through Scripture. Uh, in the promised land, God gave them prophets who called them back to God, and wise men who taught them great wisdom, which is recorded in Job and the Psalms and Proverbs and so on so that we have wisdom literature in our Bibles, which also points forward again and again to Jesus. And then when they turned their back on God and they uh, worshipped idols, God sent them prophets to rebuke them. And you have a sort of spiritual crisis going on through the time of the prophets. Why is God sending us into exile? What's going on? How is this going to be played out? Um, and throughout that time, there are prophets not just preparing them for the return from exile, but also preparing them for a greater return from exile, when Jesus will come, the Messiah will come, and who will ultimately end the exile from God's presence. And so the Old Testament is continually preparing us for Jesus. It's continually foreshadowing Jesus. It's continually pointing forwards to Jesus. It, it tells us about then, that time they were writing him, but it also points us forward to Jesus, which is why John describes it here as the Word of God. It's one word. It hangs together. But it's also the testimony of Jesus. Do you see that? The whole Word of God reveals God's plan for the world, and it reveals Jesus to us. It is the testimony of Jesus. The center of human history is what God has finally revealed in his Son. It's recorded for us in four Gospels and what he carried on doing in the Acts of the Apostles. It's recorded in the New Testament letters, and it's now finally completed in these visions of the glory of Christ in, in Revelation. In other words, the Word of God holds together it is coherent. It is our rock, our foundation on which we can build our Christian lives. So here's the question. Are you discouraged by the indifference of the world? Are you discouraged by the way the Bible is ignored and rejected? I was in the Abingdon bookshop the other day and I was chatting to the manager, and he said, a lady came in to the bookshop, bookshop the other day, and she said she wanted a Bible, but she wanted the second edition. What do you mean by the second edition? Second edition of which translation? I don't know, but I know it's got to be the second edition, she said. And after about five minutes of scratching the head, she realized that what she needed was a New Testament. The second edition, you see. The first edition was the Old Testament. Now I want the second edition, volume two. That's how ignorant of just basic biblical terms like Old Testament and New Testament people are. 
I did a Bible study in Kesgrave with the young people about Abraham taking Isaac up Mount Moriah. And at the end of the Bible study, one of the boys revealed that he thought the whole time I was talking about Abraham Lincoln because he'd never heard of any other Abraham. Oh, I may have told you that story before. That's how ignorant our world is. And yet, the Bible is still the Word of God. These 66 books by about 40 different authors is a miracle, isn't it? Written over one and a half thousand years, and yet it doesn't contradict itself. It is the perfect Word of God, and it still speaks, and it still arrests the conscience. Phil Reed, who's translating the Bible in West Africa, got an audio Bible to an 83-year-old man who'd never heard the Bible in his own language or any other language. And he said, when he became a Christian, he said, now I know why I've lived to be 83, so I can hear this wonderful news for the first time. I must tell all my family about this. This is the power of God's word. God's word has lost, lost none of its power. So look at verse 3. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it, because the time is near. And that's an interesting phrase, that, isn't it? Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. You see, in John's day, not everybody could read. Can you imagine nearly 500 years ago when King Henry VIII ordered that a Coverdale Bible, I think it was, should be chained in every church and read aloud for the first time? Can you imagine in Beckles Parish Church that moment when the people of the town gathered around the lectern? Most of them probably couldn't read, but someone who could read the Bible in English in this town for the first time. What a wonderful moment that was. Do you know what? I'm going to hazard a guess, and this is nothing negative against Beckles. I, what is true of Beckles, I'm sure, is true of nearly every town in this country. The ignorance of God's word is extreme. And people in your town reading it for the first time will discover what a huge and dramatic challenge it is to read this book. Have you challenged your non-Christian friend to read the Bible with you? Maybe to read the story of Exodus if they like stories, or, or as it's Christmas, to start with the Christmas story in Luke and go through the whole of Luke with you. Uh, have you challenged them to do that? Go for that challenge this Christmas. It's a tremendous opportunity. The first part of reality is that God has spoken and his word is trustworthy. Second, the Lord, verse 4 and 5. John turns to his readers who he describes as the seven churches in the province of Asia, and he says, now I want you to think about God. And he brings them a greeting in God's name. Grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come. Grace and peace to you. It's a very familiar phrase, isn't it? But it's more than just a formal greeting. The God John writes about is a God of grace. A God who shows favour to sinners. Most of you, because there's been a big churn of people here, most of you are strangers to me this morning. I don't know if you're in church for the first time today. Exciting if that's true. Or, or maybe you're just still finding your way. You've never discovered this truth for yourself before. Our relationship with God is on the basis of his grace, his favour to sinners. And he's chosen to save a vast multitude of people. And his grace always takes the initiative. He's at work in you if he's got you into church. He's got something to say to you, and you can't resist it. There's no point in resisting it. And he sent his son to be the perfect man and to die the most wretched death uh, in the place of sinners as the ultimate act of grace. And then having purchased salvation for us to do the gracious thing of going beyond that, to come and find us through other Christians, taking the gospel out into the world, and they came even to you and me, and beyond us to others. And God is so gracious that he's patient with us. Through all our obstinate refusal to believe, he's patient with us, and he's working in us, and he leads us to believe and to repent. That's the grace that's at the heart of the character of God. And because of his grace, we also have his peace. We can enter into his presence, as we have done, singing his praise. Grace and peace to you. We're received in peace because of his grace. 
But then John mentions all three persons of the Trinity. First of all, God the Father. Grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come. You could apply those words to all three persons of the Trinity, but he seems to be particularly talking here about God the Father. God does not fade out of our lives. Politicians fade out of our lives, don't they? Some of those who've resigned this week, that will be it. They'll never be in power again. Think about American presidents. Yes, the Obamas have their books coming out, but once their memoirs are published, they'll be forgotten. And Michelle Obama will be on Radio 4 this week, but it's kind of that feeling of, oh yeah, do you remember Michelle Obama? <laughs> and George Bush, you know, you can find his speeches on YouTube if you go looking carefully, but he's, he's a forgotten man, isn't he? Some people are saying, you know, our present crisis is as big as the days of Jim Callahan, and anybody under the age of about 50 is saying, who on earth was Jim Callahan?" you know? Um, that's what happens, isn't it? God does not fade out of our lives. God is eternal and unchanging, utterly reliable. There will not be some story that comes out and just completely kills our confidence because it shows us what he was really like. He is holy. He is altogether other. And secondly, he fills the universe by his Holy Spirit. If it, it, God, John points them to he who was and who is and who is to come, and he brings grace and peace from the seven spirits or the sevenfold spirit before his throne. Seven is the number of completeness in this book. And in several places, the Holy Spirit is described as the seven spirits or the sevenfold spirit. It's a very powerful way of talking about the fullness of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is all-powerful, and he's filling this world, and he's limitless in what he's doing, and God's grace working through the work of the Holy Spirit can awaken anyone. There's no one who's beyond the reach of God's grace. And this grace and peace come to us from God the Father and from the Holy Spirit. And verse 5, from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth. The God in whom we trust has in these last days spoken to us through his Son. And Jesus is the faithful witness. You know, when the world is filled with unfaithfulness, we cling on to this faithful witness. Everything God has revealed and done is fulfilled and completed in all its perfection in his death and his resurrection. And he's the firstborn from the dead, the first one to be raised immortal, never to die again. And he's ascended into heaven, and he sits on his Father's throne, as Tom was reminding us earlier. And he's the ruler of the kings of the earth. It's a huge theme in the book of Revelation. Take comfort, John, in your prison colony quarry where you're bashing the stones, and life seems utterly pointless. Jesus reigns on the throne of heaven. And the Son of God is Lord over all the powerful kingdoms of the earth. You know, to John, it seemed like the empire of Rome... Was, was going to be victorious and the Christian church be snuffed out in the first generation. How wrong that fear was. Empires and kingdoms rise and fall and we fear them in their pomp, but they do not intimidate the ruler of the kings of the earth, for he is still Lord. So this is reality as God sees it. The Word is trustworthy, we can trust the Word of God, and the Lord reigns. The Word and the Lord, let's come to the third element of reality, and that's you, the church. The church. Look at how reviled the Christian church is today. People laugh at us. People think we are a spent force. If you watch the, the movies of Richard Curtis, you know, the Notting Hills and Bridget Joneses and all the rest of Four Weddings and a Funeral, all those films have a, have a vicar in, don't they? A bit like Dad's Army. They always have a wet vicar in. That is the picture of the Christian church in British culture, isn't it? Hello there, you know, that sort of um, kind of character. John gives us a great reality check. 
In his doxology, John gives glory to Christ for what he has done to make us as his church. First of all, he says, and he's, he's whipping himself up into doxology here in verse, end of verse 5, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood. That's a great description of a Christian church, isn't it? To him who loves us. He looks at his church and he loves us. Isn't that marvelous? It's love, the love of Jesus that has brought you together as a church. It's not the fact that you like a particular chair or a particular kind of hymn singing, or a particular building, or a particular time of day. It's the love of Christ that has brought us together and makes us love one another in spite of who we are. Because that love has freed us from our sins. He loves us and has freed us from our sins by His blood. Why is it that a Christian church has to take communion so regularly? Why do we have to do that? It's partly because we're forgetful. That's why we do these things in remembrance of me, says Jesus. But it's also to remind us that we have been redeemed. That every one of you who's a Christian here today and a member of the church has been redeemed in Christ. He has set us free from all the things that should chase us down the days and down the years. You heard the story this week about Lord Lester, uh, the Liberal Democrat peer who's been uh, disciplined by the House of Lords for sexual harassment. Uh, he claims he hasn't done it, so I don't know if the allegation is true, but it's a long time ago, isn't it? This is going back many years, and some of the people who've gone to prison went to prison for things they did in the 60s and the 70s uh, through the whole Operation Utri thing. Um, and we live in a society that never forgives. Have you noticed that? It always wants justice, quite rightly, and when people are deprived of justice, that's a terrible thing, but it's also a society that has no idea of grace and forgiveness. Maybe you struggle to forgive yourself. There are things you did years ago, and they still haunt you every day. When you wake up, you think about them in the middle of the night. Listen to the good news of the gospel. He loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, by his death. They are dealt with at the cross. And this is radical good news for anyone who comes from a Roman Catholic background, from a Muslim background, from a Hindu background, from a Jewish background, or even from a sort of secular political correctness background where you can never be good enough for the political correctness movement. You can never have enough virtue. Every one of those people knows that they failed and they know that they cannot atone for their sin. This is good news. Christ loves us and has freed us from our sins. Those he sets free are free indeed. And that's the Christian church. That's why we exist. Because here there is forgiveness. Here there is a new beginning. But not just that. He has given us a new calling he has made us, verse 6, to be a kingdom and priests to serve his God and Father. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. A kingdom and priests. Now that's echoing the language of Exodus 19, when God told the people of Israel at Mount Sinai, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. That's going to be your life. The whole of you as a nation are going to be a kingdom who, who stand between heaven and the rest of the world. And, and your calling is to pray for the rest of the world on their behalf and also to bring God's word and demonstrate it to the rest of the world. They will look in on the life that Israel has with God and they should see a distinctive and different community. That was the theory. And obviously, like ourselves, they failed but the same calling is ours today. We are Christ's kingdom. If you're a Christian, you belong to Jesus as king. You're a subject of his kingdom. We are the beginning of the spread of his eternal rule. We come to surrender to him. And as we become part of his kingdom, so that kingdom spreads to others. And we show the rest of the world what it means to be under the lordship of Jesus, under the kingdom of Jesus. 
And amid all the lawlessness and all the hopelessness around us, the rule of Christ in our lives, what does it show? How does it show? Well, it shows in a changed lifestyle, doesn't it? People look at us and say, there's something different about you. People come to this church and they say, oh, this is different. There's something fresh and real here. Yes, it's because you're among a kingdom of priests, people who worship God together. And it's interesting, isn't it? We are a kingdom and priests to serve our God and Father. What did a priest do? In Israel, a priest stood between heaven and, and the nation, uh, took the prayers and offerings of the people and offered them up to God, and, and it took the word of God and preached it to the people. And the wonderful rediscovery of the Reformation was that that is true of every Christian. In the New Testament church, there's no priesthood except one. All of us who are Christians are priests. We all stand between heaven and earth. See, the Bible was translated into the vernacular languages during the Reformation, and it's a huge treasure. It means that you can take your Bible home with you and read it at home and read it with someone else, and, and you've every right to do that. You don't need someone between you and God. You can read it for yourself. It's a hugely dynamic, democratic thing that the Bible belongs to everybody. And we worship the same God and we find our purpose and fulfillment in knowing Him and saying to Him, be glory and power forever and ever. So the Word of God is trustworthy. The Lord reigns. He loves His church. He's made, a king, made us a kingdom and priests to serve him. But there's a warning for the world. And that's in verses 7 and 8. It's a very solemn truth. Seems hard when Christians live godly lives and we get slandered for it, while evil people prosper and unbelief is honoured. Seems hard when that happens, doesn't it? But a day is coming when all that will be put in context. Verse 7. Look, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, and those who pierced him, and all peoples on earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. Those are very solemn words, aren't they? That's why we do world mission. That's why we go to reach the unreached peoples of the world. There will be a day when every Christian will be vindicated for their faith and the masses who have never heard, who have never believed, who have rejected it, will be exposed and it will be too late. And that should be the great motivation for our mission. This is the world this world desperately needs to hear and read the Word of God. And the Word of God is reliable. This world desperately needs to hear of God the Father, who is and was and always will be. And of the Holy Spirit, who is at work throughout this world. And the Lord Jesus, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth. And it needs to hear that through you, through your church, Loved and called and forgiven by Christ to live out his kingdom here. And we need to grasp this reality that Jesus is coming and every eye will see him. This is reality as God sees it. Let it shape your whole life. Who's to be the be all and the end all of your life? Who is it that really matters to you? When you switch off and you relax, who do you think about? Remember that they will quickly fade. They'll be gone, just as we will soon be gone. But God says to us, I am the Alpha and the Omega, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Amid all the political earthquakes of our country at this time, put your confidence in God and His gospel and His church 
and let him shape reality for you as it truly is. We're going to sing together our closing hymn.